Good morning, Life Church. Everybody stand to your feet. Are you ready to give God some amazing praise this morning? Okay, now here's what I want you to do. We've come into his house. The Bible says that uh, it was good when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. But the Bible also says, come into his presence with thanksgiving and go into his presence with praise. So that's what we want to do this morning. We got a new song. At least it's new to the worship team. You may have heard it a thousand times on Caleb already. But uh, we've, uh, I love this song. It talks about hearing the sound of broken shackles hit the floor and the sound of broken people being restored. And it says, here in your house, we're going to praise your name. We're going to praise you loud. We're going to praise you with passion. And the joy of the Lord is going to break out. Is anybody in this house ready to give God your best praise? I said, are you ready to give God your best praise? Come on, turn around and tell somebody, give them a high five and say, let's praise God with all of our heart. There's a net going in the spirit. Come on. If you listen closely, you'll hear it. The sound is broken, shackles hit the floor. There's a symphony and the making. There's a freedom here for the taking. Oh, what a sound is broken, people are restored. Yeah! Oh, what a sound of your people singing here in your house let your praise be loud here in your house let your joy break out as our voices fill the room do what only We're going to worship you. There's a sound that spans generations. It's the same no matter the language. Oh, what a sound. I to the Oh, what a sound as we unite to praise the Lord. Here in your house, let your praise be loud. Let it be loud. Yeah. Here in your house, let your joy break out. Let it break out. As your voices fill the room, do what only you can do. Here in your house, we're gonna worship. We're gonna worship you. Worship you, King. Surely the Lord is. Surely the Lord is in this place. Shout if you want. Come on, let me hear a shout. Surely the Lord is. Surely the Lord is in this place. Every blood bar saint, come and praise His name. Surely the Lord is. Surely the Lord is in this place. Woo! Shout if you want. The Lord is, surely the Lord is in this place. Every blood bond saint, come and praise His name. Surely the Lord is, surely the Lord is in this place. Shout if you want, shout if you want to give Him praise. Surely the Lord is, surely the Lord is in this place. Every blood bond saint, come and praise His name. Praise the name of Jesus. Yeah, we are. We love you, Lord. Here in this house, here in the house, let your praise be loud. Here in the house, let your joy break out. As our voices fill the room, we want all. Your house. We're gonna worship you. Yes, we're gonna worship you, our King. Come on, give him all the praise you have. Come on, let me hear you. Surely the Lord is. Surely the Lord is in this place. Shout if you wanna. 
Shout if you want to give him thanks. Surely the Lord is, surely the Lord is in this place. Every blood bought saint, come and praise him. Because you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. You in your house, let your praise be loud. Make it loud, come on. You in your house, let your joy be loud. Come on, somebody lift up a shout of praise. Come on, surely the Lord is in this place. His presence is here. Woo! Come on, lift up your hands right now. We're crying out for the Holy Spirit to invade this place. I got to catch the last few minutes a prayer this morning and that was their prayer holy spirit we want more so let's sing it i'm coming with a heart of worship i'm bringing in a brand new song i'm ready to see the unthinkable i'm praying for miracles. that's our prayer hearts praying for a fresh encounter souls are looking to the living god i'm ready for a real revival Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a bird, yes. like a fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place, fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. presence of God this morning. Come on, he's in this place. Oh, can you feel it? Heaven is real. Yes, it is. Oh, can you hear it? Our God is speaking. Oh, can you see it? He's got your healing. Oh, just receive it. Receive the free. Yeah, receive it. Oh, can you feel it? Heaven is reaching. Oh, can you hear it? Our God is speaking. Yes, He is. Oh, can you see it? Claim it. He's got your name. Oh, just receive it. Oh, just receive it. Like a fire. 
to the king.
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. This is my 
second just to make room for God. Can I just get every head bowed and every eye closed? Lord God, we're just so thankful that you are with us here today, God. I want to read a verse over us, Jeremiah 29, starting at verse 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look to me wholeheartedly, you will find me. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're just in need of finding God today, seek him out. He'll show himself to you. I can speak for myself as a depressed and alone 18-year-old young man one time. I prayed out, God, just show yourself to me. If you're real, just show yourself to me. And he did. He spoke to me directly through others, through messages. It was, it was over, almost overwhelming how clear it was that God was speaking to me. So I just pray that over you right now, that you'll just seek him with all your heart, with all your mind and all your soul, that you'll just dive deep and just say, God, I want more of you. I want more of your presence. God, I want to know who you are. God, even if I, if I don't even understand, if I just see maybe a relationship that other people have with you, God, I just want to have that relationship with you myself. Know that God says that he seeks, he came to seek and to save the lost. That he said that he'll leave the 99 to find the one. So even if this isn't for you right now, know that this is for somebody, that there is somebody in this room that right now you've had questions all week. You've been just sitting alone in, in the dark and wondering just, God, what should I do? Am I, like, what should I do? I'm just so overwhelmed. But God, you said that you will seek and save the lost. So Lord, I just pray for anybody here that just feels lost. God, I pray that you just come and you overwhelm them with your presence, with your goodness. Lord, I just thank you for the, the plan that you have for, him, for them. That God, that you said that you would give them hope and that you have a purpose for them, God. So Lord, I just thank you for this and I thank you for all the amazing things that are to come in their life, in Jesus' name, amen. Can I get an amen? Power Kids, you are dismissed. All right, all right. It's good to see y'all smiling faces. How are y'all doing? Good, good. All right, it's good to see you. All right, uh, I want to ask, do we have any visitors in the house today? If you do, just raise your hand. We're not going to make you stand up and tell us where you're from and what your hobbies are, but we just want to tell you that our, our ushers have a, a card that they'd like to give to you that you can fill that out, give them back to them when the plate comes around. And also our pastors would like to see you at the Welcome Center, just connect with you and say hi uh, at the end of service. Not right now, don't run over there, but at the end of service. Make sure I clarify. I saw someone about to get up. So, <laughs> all right, all right. Can y'all give it up for our visitors? All right, all right. Thank you, Lord, that you're here. All right. All right, so are y'all ready to give? Yeah? All right. All right, if you're ready to give, there's a couple different ways. You can get an offer an envelope from the ushers. They have those. Just raise your hand. Also, you can scan the QR code, or you can... Uh, Go to uh, 
sorry, I, I rushed y'all. I know you switched it over. So you scan the QR code or you can go to uh, lifechurchfamily.com forward slash give. Easy and effective way. You can set it up reoccurring. You can just do it the second you get paid. Sometimes that's a good way to do it, just to give the first fruits to God. It's just first thing off the top of your check, give your tithe. And that's just a easy and a handy way to do that. All right, y'all ready to give now? Good. All right. All right. All right. Let's do this. In the name of Jesus, we are believing God for jobs and better jobs, promotions and provisions, bills paid off, bills decreased, gifts and surprises, checks in the mail, creative ideas and inventions. We are believing God for all types of blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord for meeting all of my needs and giving me more than enough so I may give generously into your kingdom and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am expecting supernatural blessings this week in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Our last Thursday giving dinner this year will be held at the Wilson County Fairgrounds. At 5 p.m. on Sunday, November 20th. There's a sign of this on the table beside the welcome center. You can let us know what food you like to bring. If you like to bring turkey and dressing, the church will buy turkey for you to cook. Go and sign up today. We are going to have a great time. you need a beautiful new wreath for the Christmas season, we've got you covered. Our kids ministry will be doing a wreath auction after service on Sunday, November the 13th. So come prepare to bid. There will also be hot cocoa and cookies for sale for you to snack on while you bid. If you like to make or donate a wreath for the auction, let us know. You can send an email to info at lifechurchfamily.com. Would you like to be part of our great video ministry? We are looking for people that would like to be a camera operator. It's a great way to get involved and we will even train you. Sign up today at the information table or email info at lifechurchfamily.com. Our men's Bible study live group will be meeting this Thursday, November 10th at 7 p.m. in the Life Cafe. Come out and join us for great food, fellowship, teaching, and prayer. Don't forget, that's this Thursday here at church at 7 p.m. See you there. Tomorrow night, that's Monday night, November 7th, our young adult Bible study group will be meeting at Pastor Stephanie Oliver's home at 7 p.m. Bring your Bible and a pen and a notebook. You don't want to miss it. You can bring a friend too. If you need more information or directions to Pastor Stephanie's home, see any of our staff at the end of the service today or email us at info at lifechurchfamily.com. The Nashville Dream Center is giving away a two-day stay at the beautiful Hotel Effie at the Sandestin Beach Resort. All right, we can, that should have been deleted out. That's already been given away, right? Uh, By the way, speaking of the giveaway, the fundraiser, thank you to all of you that came out uh, and gave and participated. What a great night it was. And I want to just, Frankie, Corey, Merritt, uh, all the whole family, would you stand up, please? Whole Merritt family, stand up. Uh, Can we give them a round of applause? They worked themselves like you wouldn't believe to make that come to pass. And we've already seen we're going to make a a good bit of profit off of it. I will let you know at the end of service, we've got this envelope wall over here. Still some envelopes left. How does the envelope wall work? Well, there are donation amounts on each of those envelopes, anywhere from $20 to $150 or whatever. So you make the donation for that amount. We'll give you that envelope inside that envelope. There is a prize. It could be a toothpick or it could be a trip to Paris. I don't know. You're not giving for the prize. You're giving for the Nashville Dream Center and for all the outreaches we do. But in the process, you might get a really great prize or you may get what I got, which was an autographed picture of five Chicago uh, Bears football players that I've never heard of. So anyway, (laughs) if you're a Chicago Bears fan, see me after church. I only want $1,000 for it. That's all. 
signed. It's probably going to be worth millions one day. You need to grab it now while it's available. But no, th thank you to everybody that helped out. After service, seriously, if you want to go by and buy some envelopes, we would appreciate that. If we clear that entire board over there, that board alone will give uh, the Nashville Dream Center $15,000 more to operate on this year. And so that's a, that's a blessing. So thank you for helping us out. Okay, grab your Bibles and stand to your feet. Grab your Bible, stand to your feet, hold it up in the air, wave it around a little bit. You need some exercise. You're sounding kind of quiet now. You danced a lot during worship and you're tired. Now you got to wave that Bible around. Say, this is my Bible. Is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I will be what it says I will be. I will have what it says I will have. This is God's Word God for me today, today, and I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. All right, we're in week two of our sermon series, Heart Check. Heart Check, and uh, our foundational verse for this series is the one we dove into deeply last week, Proverbs 4.23 Proverbs 4.23, it says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And we've got three really important principles about the heart last week. Number one, your heart should be your priority above all else. And then it says, above all else, you've got to guard it. You need to be protecting your heart. So protection is important. Then it talks about the potential of the heart. It says, it determines the course of your life. So God's saying, above all else, guard your heart because if you'll guard the heart, I'll guard everything else. Isn't that a good, that's a good trade, right? We'll, let, we'll guard the heart and let God take care of all those other things. Um, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12 is where I want us to go this morning. Proverbs 13, 12, let me read it to you. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the the heart sick. I went to the ER a couple of years ago with chest pains. And don't worry, there was no heart attack or anything wrong with my heart. But I will say this, when you go into Vanderbilt Hospital with chest pains, man, they will treat you very quickly. I mean, three minutes and I had all kinds of people in the room. I was wired up to who knows what. X-rays were being taken. Blood was being drawn. They, I mean, they ran EKGs. They, they put me on the treadmill that, where you have to run up to the moon, you know, because it's tilted up so, so high. Uh, they, they checked every level of my body. And good news, when they got done, it was just inflammation in my rib cage. That's what was causing the pain. And they said, actually, I had a great heart. My heart was in great health. And so uh, that was good. But they wanted to make sure and check the levels. And this morning, I want you to check your hope level. I want you to check your hope level this morning. Uh, many people who attend church on a Sunday morning, especially if you come every Sunday, they're not usually having a heart problem. They're having a hope problem. They have a problem with their expectancy. They believe in Jesus. I mean, if I were to get you to raise your hand, everybody raise your hand that believes that God is a healer, that God is a deliverer, that God saves, that God sets people free. I mean, you probably all raise your hand, especially here in a Spirit-filled church where we believe the Holy Spirit's still working. But the fact is, if I had a microphone in your car or in your house or on your job, the very same people raising their hands, I would probably hear saying things like, I don't know if I'm going to be, get, be able to get through this. I'm not, I don't know that I'll ever be in good health again. Our marriage will never get back to where it used to be. I don't know that I could ever forgive them. I don't know if I could ever trust them. You know, uh, the fact is many people have a hope deficiency. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that this morning. I was reading an article. Oh, by the way, have you ever been to the doctor? You were sick, so you made an appointment to go see the doctor. Then you got in the, in the waiting room, and suddenly you started feeling better. I mean, isn't that weird? It's like, well, why did I come to the doctor? I'm feeling all better now. I will tell you what it is. Hope sprung up in you. You had a hope. You had an expectancy. Everybody say expectancy. That's what the word hope means. It means a confident God expectancy. You went to the doctor, and all of a sudden there was this hope in you that said, if I can get to the doctor, God will use that doctor or the medicine or something, and I will feel better if I can just go see a doctor. And guess what? Hope kicks in, 
and you start feeling better. I read an article by Dr. Philip Sebo. He's a rheumatologist, and he wrote an article saying, admitting he, pre he prescribes placebos. He said, many times when somebody, the medication's not working, the treatment's not working, the surgeries, whatever, didn't work, he will prescribe them something that he knows medically is of no value. It, it, it'll be perfectly safe. It might just be some supplement or whatever, and, and, but he knows there's... They've already done the test. They know this doesn't help. But he'll tell his patients, listen, I'm going to try one more thing. I want you to take this. I'm not promising it'll help. But let's just take it and let's see what happens. And they'll start taking the pill. And all of a sudden, they start having less pain. They start healing up. And they get better. And he said he got so curious, he ran MRIs on the brains of the people taking the placebos because he knew the pills he gave them didn't do anything. It was a sugar pill or it was some uh, low-grade supplement that had no value to help them with their problem. So he ran this MRI, and he used a lot of, a lot of medical terminology and uh, anatomy uh, and things that I, I, it's above my pay grade. But ultimately what he said was what they found on the MRI was when they took the placebo, something in the brain started lighting up, and it sent messages to the body and said, body, stop hurting and start healing. And all of a sudden, sure enough, the person would, the pain would begin to ease. The body would begin to heal itself. And I thought about that, and I thought, that's called hope kicking in. They, they suddenly, they got this new prescription, and they actually had a little hope that they might get better. Another doctor, uh, this guy was a, a surgeon, heart surgeon. And he, he wrote an article. He said, I wish I could prescribe hope to every patient. I wish I could prescribe hope. To every patient. He said, when people come in to my office with hope, their chances of making it through surgery, healing quickly after surgery, not having complications, all tremendously greater than the person who comes in without hope. Everybody say, I need hope. You know, when you go to the doctor with a heart issue, usually it's not that your entire heart is bad. Usually there's one or two things going on. You could have uh, a blocked artery, or maybe you could have a faulty heart valve. And I feel like this morning there's some people in the room, you've got a faulty hope valve. you got faulty hope, and God's saying, I want you to get your hope back today. You see, when, we, when, when hope's not right, then your heart's not right. And I said this last week, when your heart's not right, your life is not right. Everybody say, I need hope. I'll tell you why. Because you, this is my first point today, you were designed to operate in hope. We read there, Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Your heart doesn't work right unless it has hope. Hope is to the heart what oil is to the engine, what fuel is to the fuel pump. We had this old box truck uh, that we used for years with the Dream Center, and any time the fuel dropped below a half tank, it would start acting up. And if it ever got down to a quarter tank, it was just going to die every few minutes. It was going to die until eventually you were left stranded on the side of the road. And when it finally got it fixed, the repair guy said the problem is every time the fuel got low, the fuel pump became exposed, it overheated, and then it shut down. And he said, the, he said I, I, I was talking to somebody else about this recently, cars are designed to operate with a full tank of gas. When you operate your car on low fuel all the time, you're actually shortening the lifespan of your fuel pump. Well, see, you need to know something. That fuel pump is designed to be immersed in fuel, and your heart is designed to be immersed in hope. Your heart is designed to be filled with hope. That's what keeps the heart healthy. And again, when the heart doesn't work right, life doesn't work right. So we got to make sure that we are filling our heart with hope. The psalmist said it this way. He spoke to himself and said, Why are you so downcast, soul? What is wrong with you? Why, why, why are you sitting there hopeless? And then he says this, Put your hope in God. He recognized the key to solving his problems was getting his hope back. Everybody say, I'm going to get my hope back. It's so important that in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, God says there are only three things in the world that will last forever. He said it's faith, hope, and love. Somebody shout hope. Don't get quiet on me just because I'm preaching so well, okay? Faith, hope, and love. Hope is that important. You need hope. One of the most read books in the world every year is a book by Viktor Frankl. And those of you who are psychologists, counselors in the church, you probably studied his work when you were in college. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychologist 
who went through a concentration camp and survived and came out of it. And Victor tells the story about when they forced them onto the train. They were actually packed so tightly in that train that he said it was difficult to breathe. And many people died on the train ride to the concentration camp. And then when they got to the concentration camp, they forced you off immediately. Half, uh, half the people went into the left line. Half the people went into the right line. And those that were sent to the left line, it meant they were going immediately to the gas chambers and they would die that day. Somehow Viktor Frankl was chosen to go in the right line. He said he believed they chose the people that looked strong enough to endure the work that, that they were required to do, that they would keep. And so he was sent into the right line. One thing Victor had done, though, Victor had written a manuscript. And that manuscript meant everything to him. It contained his life's work. And so before they took him on the train, he had sewn his manuscript into his jacket. And so he gets in there. They walk into this warehouse. But immediately, the Nazi guards force them to strip naked. They take all their clothes from them. And one of the guards finds, notices that jacket's a little heavy, finds the manuscript hidden in it, pulls it out, reads a few pages, rips it, throws it in the air, spreads it across the warehouse floor. Victor Frankl said when he saw his life's work being disrespected, discarded, and destroyed, he thought to himself, I wish I'd been in the left line. I wish I'd been in the left line. He had friends, family that had gone in that line. But uh, then they forced all these naked Jewish men and women to go over and, and grab these old, stinky, used uh, uniforms. These were people that had been, uniforms from people that had been put to death. And now they would take the disgusting uniform that didn't fit. He put it on and all of them had one thing in common. They had a pocket on the front. Said for some reason he just stuck his hand down in the pocket. I don't know if he was resting his arm or what. As he stuck his hand down in the pocket, he felt a small piece of paper folded up. He pulled it out. It was a ripped up page from a Jewish prayer book. One page, and it just happened to contain the most important of all the prayers in the book, a prayer that every Jewish boy had had to memorize and say twice a day since they were five years old. He pulls it out, and it says, The Lord our God is one. He read that verse, and he just felt a little more hopeful. So then he, he read it again, and he read it again, and he began to speak that over and over, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, our God is one, the Lord, my, the Lord. And he spoke it when his, when his family members, when his mom and his sister were taken to the gas chamber, he said, the Lord. Our God is one, the Lord. And more hope began to rise up within him when his father starved to death at that concentration camp. He just kept quoting that verse, the Lord, our God, is one. When they went to his wife and forced an abortion and murdered his unborn child, he said, the Lord, our God, is one. When they put his wife to death, he said, the Lord, our God is one. When they tortured him over and over again, Viktor Frankl said, the Lord, our God is one. The Lord. And that one verse managed to get a man through all of that pain and through a concentration camp. We have 66 chapters, over 31,000 verses, people. We've got the source of hope. If one verse can get him through a concentration camp, I promise your Bible can get you through your life. Amen. Amen. Oh, Somebody say, I'm getting my hope back. See, that's why I keep telling you, you need to read the Bible. You need to study the Bible. You need to memorize the Bible. You need to be in church every time the doors are open, hearing the Word preached over and over again because the, the Word will produce hope in you. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. It will reestablish the hope in your heart. So, so number one, our heart was designed to operate. You were designed to operate with hope. Point number two, storms attack our hope. Go to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, drop to verse 20. Paul has been arrested. He's appealed to Caesar. And so now he's being transported to Rome. But Paul tells the captain of the ship that he says, you don't need to sail. Uh, the Lord has shown me we don't need to sail. This is not going to turn out well. The captain doesn't listen to Paul. Paul doesn't have a choice. He's arrested. He's being held prisoner. He's forced on the ship. They take off uh, into the sea. And then it, we get to verse 20. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun 
and the stars until at last all hope was gone. It raged for many days. It blotted out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. You know, I found that believing the Bible's promises for joy and peace and prosperity and provision and and all the many great and precious promises of God are easy to believe when the sun is shining. It's easy to believe when life is rosy, when everything's going your way. But sometimes when storms come, they cover up the sun. Sometimes the storms can become so bad, they can last so long that everything starts to appear dark. It's at those times you've got to make sure you've got a reservoir of hope in your heart. Hello? You've got to make sure that you are ready, that, you, that you, you, you've got to say, God, I need your hope. Sometimes the storm covers up the sun. Some, not, not the Son of God. Sometimes the storm covers up the light in your life. And it's, it's hard when you reach those times where life is dark. And, and let's be honest, sometimes we're like the captain of that ship and our storms are self-induced. We're in the middle of a storm because we put ourselves there, even though God said not to do it. How many of you have made a few mistakes in your life and got yourself out in a storm that you wished you'd never been in, that God tried to tell you not to go into? But I got good news for you. All all of you going through a self-induced storm right now, I want to tell you, poor decisions do not stop the plan of God. Poor decisions do not stop the plan of God. His grace is bigger than our gaffes. His mercy is greater than our mistakes. His, our decisions, they, they may mess our life up for a while, but God says, when I've got a plan for you, it's going to happen. Jeremy read one of my verses, stole part of my sermon. Shame on him. i got, I got, to, I got to punish him for that later. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, that verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, one of the most famous verses in the world. I mean, you probably have it on a refrigerator magnet or a bumper sticker or it's the screensaver on your phone. It's a great verse, but you've got to understand that verse was spoken spoken during one of the most dark times of Israeli history. They were, they were exiled out of their land, taken captive. They were, I mean, life was terrible. And it was a self-imposed, it was a self-imposed storm they were in the middle of. And you know, it's one thing when somebody else does something to you and causes you to go through a storm. But man, when you create your own storms, that's rough. When you're sitting there feeling full of guilt and shame, thinking, I, I did this to myself, that's where Israel's at. This is one of the worst periods in history for, for Israel. And in the middle of that, then we get to Jeremiah 29. Let's start with verse 10. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. God says, you are going to pay the price. You did make the mistakes. Yes, when you, when you sow seeds, you reap a harvest from those seeds. And uh, But, 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 everybody say but, because that's the next word. Yes, you're going to be in captivity for a while. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. Some, some of you need to know this morning, God says, I'm still going to do the things that I promised. You may not have always held up your end of the bargain, but I'm a God who keeps his promises. So, he says, I'm going to do for you all the good things I have promised and I will bring you home again. There's just somebody, you need to just speak that to yourself right now. He will bring me home again. Then verse 11 comes. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know you, I know you thought your bad decisions had, had destroyed my plans, but my plans are still intact. If it's according to the will of God, folks, Satan can't stop it. You can't stop it. Hello? He says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Everybody say, I have hope. I I love 1 John 1, verse 9. I think we tend to think of it as a soul winning verse, but actually it applies to soul winning and sinners, but it was written to Christians. 1 John, the whole book, it was addressed to the church, to fellow Christians. And it says here, but if we, we Christians, confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Can I tell you, you're just one prayer of repentance away from having the slate wiped clean and being right with God again. I love 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. It says, if we are unfaithful, He remains faithful. And then listen to why. For he cannot deny who he is. 
Faithfulness is not something God does. It's who He is. That's His character that cannot be changed. He is a faithful God. That's not saying you won't spend your 70 years in captivity if you choose to sin and, and go your own way. But God says, listen, you may make mistakes, but I've still got a plan for you. I've still got hope for you. I've still got a future for you. Somebody ought to just praise Him right now. Thank you, Lord. My hope is in His Word, and my hope is in His faithfulness. Because I know He's faithful to His Word. See there, you need more hope in your life? Go to the Word of God and then trust in the faithfulness of God. Now, one of the things that can really suck the hope out of you is when you get in a storm and it lingers. Acts chapter 27 verse 20 said, The storm raged for many days. It just kept going and kept going. You know, I find a marriage rarely ends because of one problem or one fight. It's the fight after fight after fight after fight after fight, problem after problem after problem. It's being taken for granted for weeks and months and years and years. And the constant friction, the constant criticism, constantly being betrayed and trust being broken. And eventually, yes, you reach that point where there's that proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. But I'm telling you, it's, it's the prolonged storm that makes you want to give up. Uh, somebody that commits suicide very rarely will one event caused somebody to end their life. It's usually years of bullying or years of abuse or years of struggling with dependency issues or years of going through constant pain and loneliness or years of ongoing fear and anxiety. But I want to tell you, I don't care how long the storm lingers, God says the sun's not gone, it's just hidden behind the clouds. Your sun is not going. It said in that verse there that it blotted, the storm blotted out the sun and stars. The sun and stars were still there. Can I tell you, your source of hope is still there, okay? It may seem covered up by your storm clouds, but it's still there. Now, you need to know this about, about sticking, sticking it out and not giving up. Satan isn't a great fighter. It's not that he's that strong. He's that persistent. Because see, he can't win the fight. You do realize Satan can't win the fight because Jesus already won the fight for you. Jesus already, he already won the battle. So what Satan does, he just tries to keep you in a storm long enough so that you'll get tired and decide to give up because he knows he can't beat you because greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. We can do all things through Christ who, strengthen us, who strengthens us. He can't beat us. So what he does, he just tries to wear us down until we're tired and we decide to quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. The God of hope still has a purpose and a plan and hope for you. Hmm. Praise the Lord. Point number three. Storms don't remove hope. They just hide it. They don't destroy hope. They don't eliminate hope. They just hide it. We read there the, the, the storms blotted out the sun, but the sun was still there. It's interesting there. It says, until at last, all hope was gone. Now, the the word gone there is translated in the original from a Greek word that means to take away or to remove, but it doesn't mean to eliminate. And then back in Proverbs 13, 12, it said hope deferred makes the heart sick. The word deferred there doesn't mean to eliminate, doesn't mean to destroy. It just means to carry off or to remove or to hide. Uh, and I just... I feel like that's why God spoke what He spoke in Jeremiah 29, 11. He said, I know it looks like your hope's been destroyed, but it hasn't been. It may look like my plan's been eliminated for your life, but it hasn't been. I know the plans I have for you. I've got plans to give you hope and a future. Things may look bad. The storm may be lingering. It may be so dark you can't see it, but hope is still there. The promise is still there. The plan is still there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Acts 27. Go down to verse 22. It says that Paul spoke up. You know, they, they started throwing things overboard. The storm was getting really, really, really rough. And it says, Paul said, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take 
courage. He repeats that again. Take courage. Get your hope back. For I believe God. It will be just as he said. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. Where the, the ship's going to crash. You're going to lose everything on board. But we're going to be safe. So guys, get your hope back. God said to Paul, Paul, I want to give you hope. I want to make sure you've got hope. Then he tells Paul, share that hope with somebody else. Get the hope back in them again. And I feel like God is saying this morning, your storm will not last forever. You've got a sunrise of hope coming. Let me say that again. Your storm will not last forever. Storms don't stay forever. Eventually the storms go and the sun comes back out. And somebody here needs to know that your, your sun is about to rise. One more verse and I'm going to wrap things up. Romans 15 verse 13 says, and this, was, this is Paul's prayer for all of us. It's God's prayer for all of us. It's my prayer for you this morning. I pray that God, the source of hope, will completely fill you with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then, when is then? When, when the God of hope fills you with joy and peace because you trusted Him. Once you trust Him, He said, then you will overflow with confident hope. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. There's the three components to refilling your hope. You need the Word of God. You, you, you got to have the Word of God in your life. you got to trust in the faithfulness of God. Trust and say, God, I know it's who you are. And then, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me and restore to me like David prayed after David had made his big blunder in Psalm 51. He said, God... Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of my salvation. Some of you need your joy back. I, I, okay, there was this movie that came out. I guess it's been a decade or two ago. I never saw the movie, but the title always intrigued me. How Stella Got Her Groove Back. I don't know how Stella got her groove back. Never saw the movie. And don't go home and watch it. It may be filthy. I don't know. You... Somebody's saying, yes, it is filthy. So don't go watch the movie. But that movie title popped in my head. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, somebody's going to get their heart groove back today. Somebody's going to get their joy back today. Somebody's going to get their peace back today. Somebody's going to get refilled with hope today. And it's important. It's one of the three things that 1 Corinthians 13 said will last forever. <laughs> you need faith. You, you need hope. And you need love. You need everybody to say, I need some more hope. Close your eyes and bow your head. I want to pray for you. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know this, this word is for some people that are in desperate need of refilling your hope. You need your hope refilled. And I'm hearing the Lord say, today is the day. Listen to his word. Trust in His faithfulness and let the Holy Spirit refill you. Consume His Word. Trust His faithfulness. Let the Holy Spirit fill you. And when you get your hope right, you'll start getting your heart right. And then when you get your heart right, life will start to become right. Father, I pray for anyone here struggling. If you're here, again, nobody looking around. Give everyone around you some privacy. If you're here and you'd say, Pastor, I'm going through a really tough storm right now. Would you raise your hand? I just want to pray. Okay, I see some people going through some tough storms. Several hands. Okay, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I know my hope level is low. I need more hope. Raise your hand. Wow, even, I think even more hands went up that time. You just admitted it to Him. I've given you the prescription, okay? You've got to make sure that you fill your life with His Word. You've got to put your faith and trust in His faithfulness. And now I want you to pray, Holy Spirit, fill me. Father, I'm praying right now for your Holy Spirit. Prayer team, if you would come. I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to just fill every person that raised their hand. And even those that did not, Holy Spirit, come. We, we sang it earlier, Holy Spirit, come. Like a fire, like a flood, fill us, fill us. We need you. We need you. We cry out to you. Oh, God.
we put our trust in your faithfulness in your faithfulness to your plan and we ask you to fill us with your hope God just begin to heal the wounds begin to heal the hurt just like those people that took the placebo and suddenly a placebo that had no real actual effect whatsoever it somehow triggered hope God do something a placebo could never do fill people with your word and ignite real hope lasting hope right now God restore joy restore peace raise faith levels raise hope levels mend the wounded hearts I'm asking you father now if you raise your hand why don't you just lift your hand up right now and just start asking say God fill me with your Holy Spirit fill me with your Holy Spirit some of you you need to come up and just receive prayer you raise your hand you ought to come up and grab a prayer partner if they're, if they're praying with somebody else just form a line across the front we'll end up praying for every one of you we just come up and say I'm ready to get my hope back I'm ready to get my my Holy Spirit groove back my heart groove back I'm ready to be restored I'm ready to see God show up and I'm ready to see this I'm ready to get the Sun out from behind the clouds if you need prayer I want you to come if you need prayer for if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life please don't walk out of here without him because I said Satan's not a great fighter he's good at fighting people that don't have Jesus he can kick your rear end when you don't have Jesus okay if you're not a born-again Christian if you if you don't know Jesus as your Lord if you're not ready for eternity come and grab one of these prayer partners as well say pray for me I need to be born again or maybe you're here and you've known the Lord but you've walked away maybe you pulled a David King David you know you've, you've had your your sin you've let come into your life and now you're like David ready to say God refill me with your Holy Spirit don't take your spirit from me but restore to me my hope if you need prayer for healing in your body if you need prayer for anything we just love to pray for people we love to see why do we like praying for people we like seeing God show up and change your life we care about you we love you we want God to meet your needs so right now we're opening up the front for prayer if you need prayer come if you would just sing that song that's being played
to do whatever you want to and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to oh. here is where I lay it down you are all I'm chasing this is my surrender, this is my surrender, here is where I lay it down, you are all I'm chasing now, this is my surrender, this is my surrender. I just want to remind you of that verse that says that our God is such a good God, he won't allow you to be tested beyond what you can handle. I just somebody needs to hear this. God's not going to let that storm overwhelm you. It says, it says what he'll do is he will make a way of escape before it can overwhelm you. He loves you. He never forsakes you. He never leaves you. He never abandons you. No matter how dark your storm may seem, God says, I'm right here by you. I'm right here by you. Father, I'm just asking you now just to send a mighty outpouring of hope this morning. Send a mighty outpouring of hope. Refill every wet reservoir in everyone's heart that's low on hope. Fill them with hope in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you're healing every broken heart. Thank you that you are restoring everything that's been stolen and robbed. What an amazing God you are. How awesome you are. And we make room for you. We make room for you this morning. And we say, I will make room for you. And I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Oh. Wow, that was a great word this morning, wasn't it? We just have a few closing announcements. Let's just be mindful of those who are still praying this morning. Um, any visitors, if you're at your for your first time, please see the pastors in the very back welcome center. They have a small gift for you. Also, don't forget the National Dream fundraiser, the envelopes on the wall, stop by on your way out. And also, it is the final uh, day to buy your candles for the youth fundraiser. Um, stop by at their table after they set up. Um, and we'll just dismiss in prayer. Lord, as we depart here today, we would like to offer thanksgiving to you for the word that has come forth. Lord, bless Pastor David and his family, all our leaders and servants that have given their time as an offering to you. Lord, bless this congregation as they leave today and step into a new week. Lord, let them see your heart for them in the days to come, and let us leave here trusting in your unfailing love for us. Let our hearts rejoice in our salvation and sing your praises, for you have been good to us. In Jesus' name.